Well, good afternoon. And uh, I'm rather glad that my session is arranged immediately after a very detailed session on Dalit autobiographies. And uh, in fact, uh, I am also going to talk about something uh, in which uh, we will talk about, we, will, we are in fact going to discuss how identities like race, for example, whether it could be black American experiences or Dalit experiences in India, uh, are going to be, uh, I mean, act, playing an active role in the construction of social spaces. So in that way, I hope um, I will be able to yeah, comment on certain works in which uh, we have already been attending a discussion on. And uh, I hope uh, there is no break, right, Rajinam? Is there a break or something? No, sir, it's clear. No, all right, all right. So let me move to my presentation. I hope it is visible, right? Uh, yes, it's starting to present. It will be visible. All right, yes, all right. Is it okay now? Fine. So first of all, I've titled my presentation as Writer as Cartographer. Samad sir, hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, I hope I'm audible, right? Yes, sir. You're audible now. Okay, okay, sorry. So, writer as cartographer, an introduction to spatial literary studies is the title of my presentation. So, the first part talks about writer as cartographers. So. Uh, it, it goes, but still I think uh, in case there are students, I'm just saying that uh, in, in after the spatial turn in humanities, we are in fact uh, fearing or in fact reading the presence of spaces in literature so that uh, we compare a writer uh, with a similar function of a cartographer, someone who draw maps, right? So in a sense that writing a piece of literature is very similar to the act of drawing a map. So that's why the title is just made as uh, writer as cartographer and uh, an introduction to spatial literary studies, which definitely talks about the relation between space and literature. And I have in fact used this phrase, this phrase spatial literary studies uh, to refer to exclusively how space is in fact involved in the production of literature. Right? Primarily, space studies was an essential part of critical geography and urban studies. And uh, so I will, in the beginning, I will uh, make a rather a few strokes on to describe the wider background of space studies. Then I will move into uh, how literature and space are in fact related. So that is the primary question that I'm going to answer. And uh, after making a 40, 50 minutes I'm talking about it. I have already shared a two, two uh, chapters from two novels and we will go through a discussion and finally we will conclude it. That's how I have structured it. So let me move on to the presentation. Well, uh, this is in fact a quote from David Harvey. Uh, David Harvey is in fact a critical geographer and Harvey is in fact a Marxist thinker as well. And he was talking about a uh, uh, about in fact the, 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 in the, the initial stage of spatial study. So I've just read out it for you. I want to suggest that we have been experiencing these last two decades an intense phase of time-space compression that has had a disorienting and disruptive impact upon political economic practices, the balance of class power as well as upon cultural and social life. Probably I have put the time space compression in, in bold and that is simply to say that as part of this postmodern postmodernity, there is a time space compression that happens, which is in fact David Harvey is talking about. And uh, what happens is, uh, as we already suggested, uh, 
uh, 19th century was in fact a period of uh, history. Time was the most crucial factor in defining an object or a person. But as part of postmodernity, space became an, a, an essential component of uh, framing or constructing identities. I can make it maybe a little lighter. That you, you, I hope you remember that when we cut the trees and all, you have the rings of the trees, right? For example, uh, on the trunk, you see there are so many rings of the, uh, of the, on the trunk. And these rings, we say, are just, in fact, you know, ages that the tree has survived. So by measuring the rings on the tree, on the tree trunk, you are going to measure out, in fact, how many years this particular tree has been there. In a similar way, up to uh, 20th century, up to 20th century, human beings or, or any type of identities was essentially described in terms of time, right? But with the arrival of postmodernity, this has changed and now space become much more crucial component of describing social or human spaces. So that's it. So Harvey was in fact talking about a post-modern post condition in which time and space are in fact compressed. It becomes so much compressed that you cannot work with 19th century history models to talk about postmodern experiences. We will come to that. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, as, I, as I go ahead with that, maybe it's very curious, which I hope you may also find interesting, that in New York, there is a museum for mobiles, right? A museum for mobiles. And interestingly, a, a 2010 Nokia model mobile phone is exhibited as a curiosity in the museum so it is just 10 years past, but a 2000 model Nokia phone is just a, an object of curiosity. And a 2017 model often is an obsolete one. So in that way, with the arrival of postmodernism, globalization and all, there is a time-space compression and time has now become a, in rather, uh, in a sense, irrelevant and spatiality has in fact come out. So one issue that I am talking about is acceleration of economic activities, which definitely suggests for post fordist economic mode of production leads to the destruction of spatial barriers and distances. So with the arrival of postmodernity, there is, as Harvey suggested, a time-space compression. And this, and this was a product of the economic activities especially what you say the post fordist mode of economic activities which is very which it's a situation where uh, earlier if you are employed in a factory uh, there is a siren of the factory you go and attend the factory you spend there a stipulated time and eventually you come back right and, and what happens is your time for example your work hours are limited from nine to five or something and you spend all those times over there and by the evening you come back. That's what you call the Ford mode of production. And in, the, in that situation, what happens is, you can see, for example, your employer, you can meet fellow employees, or you can even go for a strike or something. So this was possible as a result, uh, we always knew where we are located in a particular organization. But with the introduction of globalization and the post Fordist form of mode of production, what happened is that you are in fact employed in a company, you are given a laptop or some kind of devices and you are asked to work. But what happened is you don't see the boss, you don't see the people, I mean, where you are located in the hierarchy of people employed in the same place. You also don't meet your colleagues often. And eventually what happened is resistance is almost impossible. So with the introduction of globalization, what happens is there is a kind of yeah, a post fordist to top of I mean, economic activity, which has in fact led to the destruction of spatial barriers. For example, you cannot limit one company to one state or one country, right? So such kind of barriers are also being broken as part of this postmodern condition, right? And postmodern condition generated an alertness to space. Right. So, in fact, I'm trying to trace out how exactly to place space studies within the study of humanities. 
And my initial argument, I mean, initial idea is that postmodernity has in fact, or the postmodern condition has in fact generated an alertness to space because with the time space compression, people are becoming more and more aware of the socio political spaces that they are in fact subject to. So, this is the, in fact, the broader currency of space studies within humanities or within social sciences. Right. And uh, one special thing about postmodern, I mean, spaces after postmodern condition is that it is described as a palimpsest, which means it has many layers of spaces, right? There is no homogeneous spaces. Earlier, up to 19th century, people imagined space as homogeneous, which has only one layer, space as mere a container. From that, after this alertness to space, as a result of postmodern condition, what happens is people sense, people in fact identify space as palimpsest, which means it has many different layers. And second one is that it's a hyperspace that produces derivative spaces. In other way around, many spaces are simultaneously occurring. Right? Instead of a homogeneous single layered space, you have a many layers of spaces coexisting. Not only that, space is a construct of social forces. Earlier, space was imagined as a container of objects, but now space is imagined as a construct of social forces and power discourses. So this is in fact the new mode of uh, spatial thinking and that eventually comes to uh, the studies in humanities, right? As I told you, my plan is that to give you an overall idea of spatial thinking and then come up with uh, how this is going to work with the literature. And finally, we will talk about individual texts that uh, we have already decided to work with. So just I will, I will just make a few breaststrokes here and there so that uh, uh, it makes sense, right? So what is special about spatial thinking from Renaissance to the present? That's a question. First one is that uh, during Renaissance, in fact, space was thought as a, I mean, from a linear perspective, which means space was imagined as a linear homogeneous identity. It was imagined as, in fact, quantified, which can be measured, which can be bought and sold. And by 18th and 19th century, especially the Carthay, with his assumption that body as a part of space, spatial thinking become much more developed. And again, remember that Newton's uh, view of uh, space as absolute, independent, infinite object is also there, in which the universe is uh, put into. But in 19th century, this I will just pass through and those interested to work in space studies may later explore this part. In 19th century, space as imagined as a location for great historical events. So in fact, you know, the contemporary or rather the space studies in the 1960s was a response to 19th century assumption of space as a location for historic events, which Foucault called as obsessed with history. So 19th century is imagined as obsessed with history or temporal thinking, right? And from this, from this, uh, let me say, Renaissance to 18th to 19th century, there was spatial thinking emerging. But in 20th century, it becomes different, right? And uh, I am, in fact, taken this quote from Foucault's Of Other Spaces, uh, in which Foucault talks about the present epoch, that means the 20th century, will perhaps be above all the epoch of space. Right. So it's, a, it's in fact in relation to 19th century importance given to history yeah, that uh, Foucault is talking about the epoch of space. We are in the epoch of simultaneity. We are in the epoch, epoch of juxtaposition, the epoch of the near and far, of the side by side of the dispersed. So again, uh, Of Other Spaces was in fact one of the early documents, one of the early texts on spatial thinking. 
and uh, often I mean Foucault's notion of heterogeneous, heterogeneous spaces was in fact very influential in spatial humanities. Then comes modernism and space, right? In uh, one thing is that, I hope you remember, modernists were in fact talking about a break of the linear narrative fiction, right? Which means modernism was in fact doing away with uh, linear narratives and instead trying to capture the presence, right? In that way, what we suggest is modernism brought a break in the linear narrative in fiction and the linear perspective in pictorial art, which means painting, correlated with fragmented perception of space. So for the first time, uh, space was in fact imagined as fragmented, also uh, many layered was with, in, I mean, with modernism, which was in fact talking about fragmented spaces uh, in literature. Right? Then objective space was substituted for the subjective image of space, right? Until then, especially in the realistic narratives, what we understand that there is a world outside which you are going to bring into the text so that space was in fact something objective which can be viewed. Instead of that, in modernism, what we see is that there is a subjective image of space. Space as I experience it, as a phenomenon that is uh, sensible to me, that is in fact part of my identity and existence as such. So modernism in fact was the first movement which was in fact doing away with linear narratives of space and instead bringing in a multiple layer fragmentary notion of space. That's uh, with, I think we should just uh, imagine. Then again, there is structuralist and post-structuralist notions. And in fact, most of uh, the texts written in literature and space are in fact, uh, in fact, uh, rely on post-structuralist notions on spatiality. I will just make a brief uh, so that uh, you have, when we are talking about individual texts, yeah, you have an idea that this comes from this particular group of people. And that's the only function that this introduction is going to do. So structuralism conceived of space in a manner similar to the ostensibly undifferentiated pre-cultural field, which culture then configures using meaning. So in structuralism, space is something which is pre-cultural field, which is in fact not touched upon, and then culture comes and configure it, which means structuralism presupposes a space that already exists into which we are going to engrave our identities, right? In post-structuralism, the stress that space persists in a constant refiguring of already extant configurations, which means, I hope it's a part of uh, structuralist and post-structuralist thought that in structuralism assumes that there are some pre-cultural fields where culture is going to configure and occupy, wherein post-structuralist thought, it's something is uh, available to us as we are in fact, as already configured, as already designed within the larger social frameworks. Okay, so our daily life, our psychic experiences, our cultural languages are dominated by categories of space rather than categories of time. So simply put, right from Renaissance to nine, I mean, 20th century, there was a shift in thinking of space and modernism, structuralism and post-structuralism was in fact bringing in a new narrative on space. Any problem? All right. Displacement of priority of individual experience, subjective consciousness, attention to the discourse of power explain, the emphasis on the concept of space over that of place, which I think we will talk about at a later stage. So we said so far that postmodernism alerted people of spaces that we have already suggested, but spatial thinking was already there. Modernism started thinking about perceiving fragmented spaces. Then we have also suggested that structuralism and post-structuralism also think of that. In addition to those, there were some key features that make spatial turn, that's exactly the term used, spatial turn possible. And one of it I've already made, post-Fordist mode of production, in which an employee never meets the employer, 
but become an invisible chain of soul hierarchies. Another one was neo-colonialism, decolonial process, massive movement of uh, population as a part of globalization, for example. There is migration and immigrating to different parts of the world. This definitely started uh, giving, in fact, source to a newer ways of thinking about space because earlier space was imagined as a part of a nation, but with globalization, we are breaking the state barriers, we are breaking the barriers of the states, and eventually we are immigrating or in fact displaced into newer and newer territories, so that these factors have in fact made, uh, let me say, thinking of space quite uh, uh, relevant for, for 20th century. And here are some of the theorists. I don't go into the details of those people, uh, but instead I will just suggest uh, how it works. And this I hope uh, you just take this with you. And uh, while when we are analyzing the texts, pop these, these concepts are going to work for us. And I have been included all the theorists, but only a few relevant uh, theorists of the field. One of them is definitely Henry Lefebvre, and Henry Lefebvre has in fact brought out so many texts on spatial studies. One definitely, which is in fact almost uh, an essential read for spatial thinking is the production of space by Henry Lefebvre and the urban revolution, for example, in which Lefebvre was in fact talking about a spatial triad, which means he designs, he in fact categorizes three different types of spaces one definitely is the perceived spaces, the physical world, the world that we in fact come to know, right, as it is there in the world. Second one is the conceived space, which has in fact space as, let me say, conceived and administered by states. For example, if there is a city planning, right, uh, definitely the engineers, the authorities, will have certain kind of specialization. For example, the rich people of a particular uh, city are going to live in this part of it, right? In cosmopolitan cities, you know that, uh, for example, the richest people you know, gather into one part of the city because that, be that forms the city's capes, right? And definitely the slums are going to be on another part of the city. So this way, engineers, technocrats, authorities, I mean, the people who implement spatial categories, they are in fact applying ideology or in fact their, their categories are ideological and that is what we call as perceived, I mean, sorry, conceived spaces. And the third one is lived spaces. Lived spaces is in fact a, an amalgamation of both um, perceived and conceived spaces, which is in fact lived spaces where we are in fact having both and at the same time as we experience in the human surroundings, right? So Lefebvre was very, very crucial in spatial studies, especially when we are analyzing uh, literature from a spatial point of view. One reason is that Lefebvre's thinking of spatial triad, and also maybe he he's a Marxist thinker, Marxist geographer in that sense. As a result, he was talking about the possibility of, maybe that's very important, the possibility of resisting uh, spatial, uh, let me say, configurations, right? Which means Lefebvre as a Marxist was in fact uh, argued that space can be definitely negotiated, contested, and the ideologies can definitely be resisted. So such kind of a uh, question of space is in fact uh, formulated by Lefebvre. Foucault was definitely very influential and especially his concept of heterotopias, right? Heterotropias are also often functions as resistant resistance places. This again, remember, very important because heterotropias are often described as spaces of crisis. Now, I can give you one very interesting example, which I hope I can connect with the earlier speaker of this afternoon. That if you have, if you are very much familiar with Dalit literature, for example, I've been, uh, especially I'm talking about one story by Anna Bahu Sate. Anna Bahu Sate is in fact a, a Dalit a short story writer from Maharashtra and he was writing a, a, a short story and he, write, he wrote a short story titled The Hand, I mean, 
the hand of the grave right i hope many of you have gone through that in which grave become a place in fact graves are in fact a top of heterotopias right because graves are a place where yeah the living meets the dead right so definitely in that story what happens is uh, in maharashtra when the rich people die right the upper castes have a particular kind of uh, so can, i mean kind of uh, practices social practices in which if a rich man dies he is buried with all his gold ornaments you got it what is just is in maharashtra it was a custom among upper class marathi dalits i mean sorry upper class marathi people that when the rich landlords when they die they are buried with their gold ornaments right now there is a thing that you know if a dalit go and approach an upper class man and steal the gold he will know he will know right he will definitely be killed but now what happened is that the central character beam beam in fact of the short story does one thing that he goes into the grave and grave is a heterotopy you know uh, where you know definitely people are afraid of uh, afraid of graves yeah one reason is that uh, people who are dead inside so there is ghosts or something like that so they are afraid of uh, this approaching grave because at one sense this this is exactly i mean spoken by fuko in of other spaces so what happens is that in, in the grave grave is a very difficult space in at, at one moment uh, it is part of your landscape right every city for example every village for example have a graveyard right and a graveyard is a place where the dead are buried at the same time it is this grave exists in our physical space right so the thing is that uh, in in that marathi village these rich people are buried with their gold ornaments and bhima find one way to survive because he tried to find work in the village and he fails he go to the city mumbai and there also he fails and after that he decided he found a easy way to get money and that was in fact you know yeah to to i mean to open open the graves and so what happens is in the night he goes he approaches the he approaches the graves he opened them dig open them and then collect all the gold ornaments for example the rings or the chains or any type of gold ornament that is upper caste people in fact wore and buried and he takes this out and he sell it out and he makes money right so graves are in fact a sort of heterotopia and people are in fact afraid to approach a grave because it has a certain sort of a place where uh, yeah in a sense the immortal and the mortal meet such a sort of a place part of our physical space but it transcends beyond the physical space right and that is a site of resistance so a dalit cannot approach a bunk club of an upper caste man definitely a dalit cannot uh, get gold from anywhere especially if they belong to the lower strata but they can take they can take gold from a grave no problem yeah exactly the title is gold from the graves sorry about the earlier title that was wrong so gold from the grave in fact talks about this rather spatial heterotopia in which a dalit get access to material wealth where it is denied outside right so this heterotopias this this kind of multiple layered spaces can definitely be spaces of resistance i want you take this carry with me because at, when we are analyzing the two chapters of novels beloved and uh, a house for mr bishwas i believe this concept is going to be very significant for us but remember so i suggest that a grave is a transcendental space right it has a physical presence in your everyday life you can't ignore it and at the same time it has uh, what i suggest is it has a transcendental space right and this kind of spaces are in fact spaces of resistance right we will come to that at a later stage so this concept is very very important and similar similar kind of uh, issue with the grave is there in a novel by meena kandasamy the gypsy goddess right in the gypsy goddess meena kandasamy talks about you know Uh, in a kilven mani is a village in tamil nadu where a dalit community was in fact burned alive 44 members of the dalit community was burned alive were 
and what happens is that burned alive because they were communists so the communist party wanted to propagate their political uh, ideas among the dalits which the uh, let me say the landlords will not permit right landlord will not permit uh, communist leaders approaching dalits so the communist leaders find again a shortcut to beat the dalits and that was they come to the cemetery and they organize party meetings in the cemetery right which definitely means that there are certain spaces of deviation which definitely is going to uh, function as spaces of resistance definitely the next is, i mean uh, theorist is edward soja his concept of third space which again is in fact a development of lefebvre's concept of the spatial triad which soja has in fact developed and again remember that they i mean he is a postmodernist geographer so he talks about urban spaces right remember that urban spatial studies are essential part of spatial studies uh, my concern is primarily how literature and space in fact functions or coexist right so urban if you go and search about space studies i believe that you are going to meet uh, a number of texts where there is serious uh, studies on urban spaces especially there is a, a branch of study called literary geography which specializes on how geography gets a prominent place in literary imaginations i have selected instead my title as spatial literary studies because i am talking about space as far as it can be located within the studies of literature that's why okay so david harvey is there harvey we talked about the time space compression he in fact brought about a concept right to the city which is very significant it also talks about the question of spatial justice right and again remember that one of the uh, key areas of spatial studies talks about spatial justice especially it is uh, concerned around urban poor right then there is bell hooks and dorin massi who are in fact uh, gender critics and they deal with gender and space right so i don't i, don't, I think i don't uh, i don't have to i don't have enough time to go into details and i think let's move to literature and space right okay so where how does when does or at precisely at which moment that uh, literature started engaging with space that's a question so it is it goes without saying that uh, whenever we were talking about literature there was space was there space was in fact taken for granted right what is special about spatial studies is uh, it is no more taken for granted but it becomes an essential category that's the only difference right so there is literature and space and the chronotopes by mikhail bakhtin right so bakhtin's notion of chronotopes was in fact an early moment when Uh, literary theorists started thinking about spaces right in which chronotop was described as intrinsic connectedness of temporal means time and spatial relationships that are artistically expressed in literature so in fact it was mikhail bakhtin with his concept of chronotop that he started thinking about the interconnectedness between time and space remember that he was doing it very early than the spatial uh, turn in humanities then chronotope inscribed the social into the textual configuration through jean patterns we, we we don't have to deal with that no then another movement concern when we are talking about literature and space the first one is definitely bakhtin's concept of the chronotopes then the next one was the betran vespal's geo criticism which was in fact a study how the multi faceted experience of a singular space uh, those of you who have gone through that that uh, chapter which i have i mean which i shared as i mean last day should definitely look at geo criticism as bertrand dress i mean bertrand dress part describe it which means how the multi faceted experience of a singular space or region are in the course of history represented through layers of various textual practices in another way round what we suggest is that how a particular singular place a region 
is in fact going to be represented through layers of various textual practices. Right. Russell, I mean, Westphal's concept of geocriticism is definitely very significant in our analysis of literature. And his contribution is very, very, uh, in fact, you know, uh, form a cornerstone of uh, spatial literary studies. Then we have people like Moriarty, uh, literary geography and digital humanities. And again, one thing about Moriarty's study is that he analyzes, I mean, novel especially, he analyzes novels and then says that how space is represented or how, uh, what's the role, I mean, exactly the role of space in uh, fictional narratives. For example, uh, when we are reading novels, remember that it it's a, definitely deals with spaces. And interestingly, what happens is characters come from particular geographies. For example, in a novel, the hero come from one region and the heroine comes from another region, right? Especially in 90th, I mean, 90th century realistic fiction, it was common that writers select people from different regions of a country so that as you describe the hero's journey from one place to another or the central character's journey from one part of the country to another, that geography come alive. I can give you another example, maybe in the context of Malayalam literature. In the novel Intulega by Chandu Menon, you have an instance when Suri Nambudri Pad comes to wed uh, uh, Indulega and eventually Madhavan believes that Indulega is going to get married to this Nambudri Padu as, as a Sampadam. And he is heartbroken and eventually he leaves, right? In fact, he goes on a journey, right? And what happens is that he sets out into visit different parts of the Indian subcontinent. Madhavan goes to different places. For example, he goes to uh, West Bengal, he goes to North Indian uh, states, and eventually he comes back. So one advantage for the novelist is by selecting a character from southern part of India, and this particular character is in fact undertaking a journey to different parts of the country. This is in a way, you know, what happens is as Madhavan undertakes the journey, the reader is also, in fact, coming to know about the emerging nation state. So remember that Indulega was written in pre-colonial era, I mean, sorry, in colonial era, pre-independent era. So by the time Indulega was written, there was no formation of a nation states, right? So now what happened is, as Madhavan undertakes a journey to different parts of India, whether it is a southern or northern or western part of India, what happens is Malayali readers are definitely growing with him, right? Journeys with him. And as he meets people from different areas, as he meet people from different cultures, what happens is this reading public is gradually coming to know the spatial terrain of the state. In another way around, novel is in fact helping the readers to sense the geography of the emerging nation state, which means the novel's characterization, its plot construction has definitely got a wider spatial concern. And Moriarty was in fact talking about the history of novelistic forms, exposing geographical differences in a range of novel production, reading and translations. So Moriarty was talking about a situation where Characters, narrative technique, geographical differences are in fact helping spatial constructions. And then interestingly, in, in English in Indulega by Susitaru and Anida Devasya, uh, they in fact comments that they in fact comment that uh, by making out this journey, uh, Chandu Menon was in fact connecting the middle class, the middle caste Kerala community into the larger national spaces. This can definitely be connected with imagined communities by Benedict Anderson. But remember that Moriarty also makes very interesting studies on uh, narrative and how narrative is in fact constructed by space or space is in fact becoming a part of framing the narrative. That's uh, very significant. And when you're analyzing novels, 
this part should definitely be a concern. Then again, it's, it becomes spatial studies become very essential part of post-colonial spaces or liminal spaces. And that's because, again, remember that uh, in post-colonial studies, we always talk about uh, spaces for two reasons. Number one, as you know that, for example, the boundaries of India, right? The, the so-called uh, international boundaries of India are conceived by the colonial administration, right? One of the reasons is that we have so many border conflicts are definitely because of the geographical boundaries, uh, in fact, marked by uh, the colonial administration. We have the Radcliffe line and we have enough bloodshed over there. And so what happens is that when it comes to post-colonial studies, Spatiality is a foregrounding idea, and that's because the boundaries of the newly nation states are drawn, are conceived by the cartographers of colonial administration, right? In fact, this geographical survey was a part of the colonial regime, right? They wanted to describe, they wanted to, in fact, categorize different plains of India so that their administration can function. So cartography was an essential characteristics of the colonial regime. And now what happens is that this cartography, this sense of geography described and inscribed by this uh, colonial administration had far reaching impact on the post-colonial studies. Remember the civil wars that we are waging even today is a result of territory conceived by the colonial administration. So in post-colonial studies, spatial, human, spatial thinking is very relevant, very significant. And one reason is that power is ontologically embedded in the center periphery relation, right? So when, when a nation state forms, for example, it has a power center, it has uh, the borders, the marginal spaces. And as you go, as you move away from the center of the nation state, definitely the power also uh, become less and less obvious. So power and specifically cultural politics that arise from its working is contextualized and made concrete like all social relations in the social production of space. So for example, uh, in post-colonial studies, speciality is very relevant. One I told you, the role of colonial administration in defining in, in fact, categorizing uh, geographical terrains. Another one was definitely that um, uh, that, that uh, this notion have power inscribed into it. It has defined center and periphery. And third, definitely uh, come from Europe imagining yeah, non-European -Euro territories as an other uh, geography, right? So in post-colonial studies, this this is very much relevant. Spatial construction of power can, this is maybe uh, we should be aware of, spatial construction of power can oppress or enable, could be both, power can be both, can sustain the political status quo or generate the possibility of resistance and emancipation, right? So space in itself, it's not uh, embedded with any particular sort of destructive power, but on the other hand, it can be either uh, either enabling or it could be an oppressive force depending on the way ideology functions and creates it. Colonial organization produce a, and reproduce spatial conditions of exclusion, domination and disciplinary control. Especially remember that uh, in the colonial situation of Africa, for example, there was exclusive uh, spatial terrains where natives are not supposed to enter. And in such way, in post-colonial studies, this spatiality becomes very significant. Here is what Edward Sales talks about it. Imperialism and the culture associated with it affirm both the primacy of geography and an ideology about the control of territory. So this is the case. Uh, definitely, we should be aware of that geography is definitely something, a product of ideology, and that definitely has say in the life of ordinary people, right? And uh, again, there is uh, one more, a few more terms, and we will come to the uh, conclusion. It's six, I mean, we will 
uh, wind up around 10 or 10 minutes and then we will go for the discussion. So there is two, uh, two categories of spaces, smooth space and striated spaces. In fact, these are introduced by Deleuze and Kithari in which we understand that smooth spaces are in fact infinite open spaces and striated spaces are in fact spaces which are closed, which are categorized, which are finite, right? I can give an example like when we look at the sea, sea is an example for smooth space where if a ship is moving as part of a navigation mission, then it becomes part of the striated spaces. Under the sign of uh, postmodern transgression, any border or stable striated places are shunned, penetrated, or explored in favor of digression, indeterminacy, borderlands, industrial zones, and hybrid identity. So what happens is with the arrival of the postmodern, all these striated spaces are often broken into, uh, let me say, smooth spaces, but still there are also issues at hand, which I hope we will talk if we have time enough to. So that will make a somewhat uh, an, an introduction to this spatial thought. And I believe that we will go you know, into the details of um, some of that, some of these issues uh, while we are holding a discussion on that. And especially, I, I would like to start talking about uh, reading Beloved, right, by Tony Morrison. So shall I, shall we have an interaction on that? Or? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I was just thinking, uh, do one of the participants uh, who has just gone through that uh, can make and make a, a short narrative on what exactly happens in that particular uh, chapter. I haven't taken the entire thing, but just one chapter, chapter nine of part one of the beloved. If one of the participants who have uh, gone through that make a, a description, I hope uh, that would serve better. And I can also help. Uh, stopping this monotonous monotony of the session, right? So, can one of you please um, describe it? How do you read that chapter in the beloved, which we shared last day? And very short, to around ten pages or something. Where <coughs> anybody? Uh, yeah, we will. We will. We will come to the questions definitely. Uh, I, I'm thinking. Uh, shall we? Uh, Rukmini Krishna was asking something like, will there be an end to liminal spaces? Definitely not. Because these are, this space is never a finite kind of thing. It's not fixed. Uh, so it's always uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, in a, in mobile in a sense, it is always being constructed and we can all the same time an agent or also in the product of construction. So there will be liminal spaces as long as there are social differentiation. And there is no doubt about that. So should I, um, I myself start talking about it or do one of the participants be uh, telling me how do exactly they read it? So if I have your input, uh, probably I can work on that. I understand it is five and uh, many of you are in a hurry to move out. What do you say? So maybe you can uh, start, maybe the participants, they will gradually join in. Okay. We always okay. need someone to All right. trip in. Okay, so I was talking about this novel, Beloved by Tony Morrison. And why I've selected that novel? One reason is that it's popular so that uh, it's a common book, I mean, common fiction that people use it to read. And the second one is that definitely, which I think is more uh, interesting, and that is, it definitely talks about spatiality. For example, uh, that novel, I mean, Beloved is dedicated to the slaves who are displaced from Africa. Yes, yes, Prita, she says, I mean, Abhishek and have a spiritual meeting in that clearing, right? So that novel is dedicated to displaced people, right? Africans who are displaced and now they are, they are in fact sold in America as slave laborers and eventually what happens is that their journey from Africa itself is a sort of spatial dislocation. Once they land in America, again they are slaves 
and slaves live in striated spaces they live in sort of uh, uh, confined i mean spaces bound spaces and this this novel is in fact uh, in fact records yeah the journey of a slave to freedom right so that it is, it is common place that the space that uh, that a slave occupy uh, the space that a slave is in fact uh, conceive or even experience the living space of a space is definitely yeah uh, is fixed it's bound it's closed and uh, they are they are always bound to each other and definitely their mobility is being negated sort of thing so if a, if a slave is journeying from slavery to uh, let me say freedom it's it's very clear that it's a movement from striated bound closed spaces into open infinite uh, yeah smooth spaces that that's that's there in the right in the context of the novel and uh, you know that uh, as i told you there was this atlantic slavery black, i mean black atlantic slave trade and eventually africans were dislocated from their native spaces and they were in fact uh, put into a, an alien territory which they have no sense of then what happened is they struggles to survive right so in the the novel is in fact a, a trauma sort of a a memory narrative so but what we understand is that this lady i mean sedi for example the central character of the novel she in fact uh, run away from the uh, from the landlord that named schoolmaster right and uh, she run away from the uh, from the farm from the house where she was a slave and then what happened is that she has to cross the river ohio river so that she can find she can at least be free in ohio which is supposed to be a free state uh, i i hope many of you have seen that movie 12 years a slave in which we understand that that certain states in america continued slavery where in some other states uh, slavery was abolished so what happened is that if she can make it to ohio crossing the river yeah it's possible that it's possible that she can move from bound to infinite or from from striated to yeah in a sense smooth spaces right and now there's a problem across the ohio river there is bridges built by the administration which we said as the conceived spaces spaces that the administration the technocrats the engineers the bureaucracy has built which is monitored by the surveillance of the state but she cannot make it on the bridge of ohio she will be caught because she is a slave and she cannot cross it then what happened is she find a ferry to cross the river right once on the other side of the river again she has to go through spaces which are in fact uh, often spaces that goes beyond this uh, so called uh, striated space of the state right and now the 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 in fact settle in 124 the house where the family survive and eventually what we understand is as one of the one of the comments said some in common there uh, yeah baby sharks and her spiritual gathering in the clearing so what is special about this uh, this part of the novel is it talks about a clearing right this clearing is somewhere let me say there is a jungle or somewhere out there and uh, away from this uh, human habited space and in between these two spaces there is a clearing and no description is given uh, who exactly made the place or what sort of uh, things happens there and we later on come to know that we are later on come to know that uh, baby sharks in fact uh, go there i mean she goes there meets fellows i mean uh, she acts like a spiritual teacher yeah anuja anuja we will talk about that give me a few more minutes so what happens is that the clearing is a space uh, in beloved clearing is a space that is not inscribed by the power of the state because it's a kind of a cause in in see remember that this created spaces and uh, smooth spaces are not two in i mean two to uh, separate categories so they coexist so the clearing is definitely away from 
the landlord sort of power that is inscribed in the living spaces of uh, black Americans in America. And there she, this I mean, baby Shucks was in fact able to have con con conduct a sort of communion where she's able to break the, I mean, she in fact turns that into a union of what we suggest is a sort of the individual and the collective. Uh, let me say again, past and uh, let me say the present and the personal to the I mean, community. In that way, the clearing in fact become a space within which we understand that uh, a, a, a type of resistance space is possible to create. And that's how I hope uh, that that uh, thing in fact works out, right? So race and space are sites of contestations where conflict, confrontation and subversion are involved in a struggle for resources and identity. So what we, what we understand is race is a category, a category that has a very significant role in constructing spaces so that the clearing is a particular kind of space which is away from this so-called, as I told you, the conceived spaces of the bureaucrats. It's also away from the living spaces of, uh, of the family. It's a kind of a liminal space. It's a kind of a space that is not striated, but not completely smooth spaces, where she is able to have a kind of spiritual gathering. And this spiritual gathering definitely offers a sort of transcendence to it, right? And again, remember that if, uh, if you uh, have noticed it, you might have observed that, uh, yes, like uh, uh, baby sharks, for example, uh, treats, in a sense, I should say that, it's a kind of therapy kind of thing, right? She treats and, in fact, relieves people of the trauma of slavery, right? Remember that uh, Sadi and all the family members were slaves. At present, they are free in Ohio, but definitely the memories of slavery traumatizes them. And uh, baby sharks is in fact able to, in a sense, uh, she was uh, able to provide a kind of relax, I mean, relieving the trauma of slavery. That's how the, uh, that clearing become a very significant space, right? Do anyone remember what exactly does she does in the clearing? She, she goes to the clearing and other slaves also come together over there. And they have some kind of rituals, right? Which was exactly, in a sense, ethnographically described in the novel. Uh, they have some sort of uh, rituals, ritual practices, right? And that becomes the moment when she is able to relieve the trauma of uh, these people, right? Okay, do anyone remember that? Interestingly, you know, there's a similar kind of spiritual uh, figure in Kerala too, which I don't know whether many of you are familiar. I mean, it's, it's quite familiar, but like we have uh, Poigel Apachan, for example. Uh, anyone of you familiar with uh, Poigel, Poigel Apachan's uh, method of uh, relieving people of the trauma of slavery? Definitely, we too, in a sense, we too had slavery practiced, which Sanal Mohan was talking about. The, um, modernity of uh, slaves of modernity of so what happens is we similar we similar we had a similar uh, similar type of uh, slavery and definitely a mechanism to relieve people of the trauma of slavery and Poigel Yohannan or Poigel Apachan was in fact one of the key figures of this kind of an alternative spirituality where he assumed to in, in fact he assumed to have uh, uh, to be a sort of spiritual guide and he had so many followers and they practiced a sort of religious rituals. Yes, yes, they were asked to, uh, yeah, fine, that's right. Okay, Priya said it, let me check. Yes, Prita, he says, they were asked to express their repressed emotions by dancing, laughing, crying. Sure, that is what baby Shak does and a similar thing is in fact done by yeah, Poigel Yohanan in Kerala. I hope you might have I mean, heard that song. Kanum Nilurakshadevum Yendevam Shate Pati. In fact, what, what Poigel Yohanan was doing is a sort of a sing dance kind of thing. 
where the slaves you know again remember that slaves do not have any written history on their credit so what happens is they are traumatized by these experiences of slavery but they cannot articulate it again verb, verbal expression doesn't find any any uh, relaxation for that matter so eventually what happens is poigel appachan was in fact asking them to sing songs and as they sing and, uh, and sing and dance the tensions brewed up in the body is in fact relieved right so it was a kind of an alternative spirituality which in fact uh, happened to be the, uh, simply gathers the community together and encourages you no know, she asks them to for example she asks yeah <clears throat> the women to cry the men to dance the children to laugh then they change the roles and eventually what happens is they are involved in a particular kind of uh, ritual through which the memories of this slavery the trauma of the slavery is in fact relieved apachan was exactly doing the same thing in kerala and in the novel i believe that baby shucks is involved in a similar kind of racial or uh, ethnic or ritual practice through which the tension that is built into the body is in fact relaxed again remember that body is also a site of spatial uh, existence right so baby shucks is doing some what same thing you might have also noticed that uh, uh sede and her two daughters denver and beloved uh, go to the clearing uh, and uh, she sits who say the sits on the seat where baby shark used to sit and then what happens is uh, she feels that uh, the hand of uh, baby shark touches her her neck and uh, to goes to an extent that she gets suffocated right Uh, she uh, she find hard to breathe and denver jumps into it and eventually she comes back to it so if you read that chapter on the clearing what we understand is that that has a multi sensory dimension of space i hope it's clear in which clearing is a kind of uh, geography kind of a space within which what we understand is the power relations that that uh, in fact inscribe into the living spaces do not enter so it's a kind of a liminal space in that way a kind of smooth space not exactly but comparatively where they are in fact able to assert their identity able to relieve their stress uh, the trauma that they go through and eventually their bodies and the clearing uh, somehow kinds a kind of harmony or a top of a uh, type of unity that that becomes a significant part of it so one thing that i i stress is that uh, spatial uh, i mean representation of space could definitely be a, a, a sort a, a place where liberation is possible it could enable a sort of uh, liberation right uh, so just instead of becoming just a, a, let me say uh, a passive uh, uh, let me say uh, spectator what happens is that in beloved what we understand is certain kind of spaces i should say certain kind of spaces liminal spaces are in fact constructed and where they could in fact find their physical body uh, their spatial i mean entity could find expression with the larger let me say space i mean the the larger geo territory of the clearing and that will find their way for a resistance that's what i hope uh, a, a, a casual reading of that chapter could definitely bring that in right the dominant interest groups regulate and define both spaces and racial constructions that's of definitely it's common place so she they finds her way home uh, we said it i don't i don't think we have to talk about it so there are alternative maps for example the man who helps uh, sedet cross the river you know some ways in the river which may not be available to the uh, the cognitive map makers so there are different types of maps there is fugitive maps right for example if you are a fugitive you cannot use the spaces that are available to citizens right and if you go to spaces where citizens occupy definitely you are going to be caught so fugitives have to let me say 
yeah, create certain kind of maps which goes beyond these cognitive uh, maps that I mean, sorry, uh, which in fact goes. Sorry, uh, what is it? Okay, okay, no problem. So this fugitive maps is going to be alternative map making process. There is food nourishment maps, right? Like for example, Dalits were not uh, given enough food, and eventually they have to go to the forest and collect some sort of uh, that means a vegetables or leaves and eat it. Then, then there is family maps. There is musical maps. So. Other than the conceived maps created by bureaucrats and administration, there are alternative maps. And literature is, in fact, one of the places where these alternative maps are, in fact, acting as sites of resistance. Right. So the very process of producing map is an assertion of power. Right. So there are sub uh, sections where power is again partially employed and is embedded in the specific system of knowledge, I hope. So carving out spaces for social, physical, spiritual moments of unrequited freedom and possibilities. That's what literary spaces can do, right? Beloved can do one thing, that is to carve out spaces for social, physical and spiritual moments so that these spaces act as a platform, a string board for uh, liberatory movements. A second one is that the clearing, in fact, transform the physical space of the clearing into a transcendental one, which acts as a medium or agent of relieving slave memories. Right. So that's uh, what uh, I don't know whether anyone would like to talk about anything else that you have uh, read from the novel. If you have gone through that chapter, I mean, I, I welcome you to make a comment so that we can think about it. I'm especially I'm moved by the multi-sensory description of space given in the clearing. For example, there is song, there is dance, there is crying, there is laughing, weeping, and also definitely a kind of spiritual transcendental space. So Westphal was in fact talking about describing space in multi-sensory layers and clearing is a perfect example for uh, such kind of descriptions right so the clearing uh, is a meeting point in which restrictions of perceived and conceived spaces are transgressed and unites the individual and the collective the old and the new world the sacred and the secular the oral and written the intellectual and the spiritual the living and the dead and the unborn. So what happens, the, the particular speciality of the clearing is helping the uh, black Africans to link with their past in Africa, their journey through the black Atlantic, and also their, their traditions, their ancestors, and all those, let me say, connections. So the space is enabling them to assert better and Yeah, I, I, I request you to, to read that chapter, I mean, The Clearing, which definitely is a wonderful writing on transcendental space, where space acts as a sort of, yeah, a third space in a sense, right? Which, which crosses the barriers of physical and conceived spaces. Okay, any, anybody, anyone else going through the, uh, the novel? A reading a house for Mr. Bishwas would like to make any comments and I have suggested the last chapter, last not last, a chapter from the last part of the novel in which uh, Mr. Bishwas has in fact bought a house and uh, when he had a first impression of the house uh, it was in fact in a very good condition, it was uh, in a sense that it was a perfect thing that he was waiting for and he buys it, and the moment he buys it, he started finding problems with it. Any anyone would like to talk about that aspects? Uh, I mean, a uh, yeah, house for Mr. Bishwa is definitely was a text often prescribed, so it's it's easier to talk about that. Okay. <clears throat>
again, uh, one, one interesting thing about this is that, I mean, it talks about a house, right? A sort of concept of a house. And uh, I was especially referring to uh, the post-colonial spaces in a house where Mr. Bish was. But what we understand is that the Caribbean <clears throat> island where, 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 let me say, uh, Mr. Bishwas was in fact living, or for that matter, Naipaul was living. But what happened is it became a belated space, right? Belated space in the concept that, in one sense, yeah, the idea of domestic space in relation to home, yeah. Uh, more than, I mean, uh, more than about the domesticity, it's there because the house is described and it's something like 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 uh, Vishwas comes to visit the house to, to in fact to live in, in it that he find what it, I mean it, it was very attractive when he had a first look at it then he start finding different different folds that is built into the house right very insightful deliberation about <laughs> yeah we will conclude it soon now don't worry so the question that uh, we are answering is a house for Mr. Bishwas is in fact a uh, house is definitely a space, right? A lived space, a living space. And house is also in a sense uh, a particular kind of space because that differentiates you from the world, right? So there is the house and the world, the world outside as a one, yeah, a whole uh, discriminant part of the house. And there is the how I mean I mean the world as something broader, wider, beyond your personal reach, and house is something that confines you within that often brings a sort of security into it. Right? I recommend you you read that uh, book by Bachelard, The Poetics of Space, where he describes about uh, spaces, especially home as a space. Beautiful. So I mean I, I think it's time that I conclude. I was saying that uh, these Caribbean islands, remember that people in the Caribbean islands were usually intentioned laborers. They were in fact laborers taken from India and other parts of Asia. And uh, what happens is that once slavery was abolished, there was a need of laborers. So laborers were taken away from different countries, including India. And what happens is that uh, Bishwas is in fact uh, in a sense, excited by uh, the speciality, the cultural culture of colonial forces. But what happens is that he lives in the Caribbean, which is in fact promised to deliver modernity, but it definitely failed to provide it. And that uh, those those conflicts are in fact described in uh, a house where Mr. Bish was by uh, Nyport. Okay, and, and again, it's also a question of territory. If you read that novel, A House for Mr. Bishwas, right from the part one to the last, it's a quest for a geography of one's own. It's a quest for, in a sense, it was asking about, uh, it was in fact an attempt to, to locate oneself within a geography that is totally aligned to him or to the person, right? In that way, uh, this uh, house for Mr. Vishwas is also talking about how the colonial regime, in fact, structure the spaces of the post-colonized, right? I think it is high time I stop.